Our month-long look back at 2017 is almost at an end, so today we're taking a look back at the most shocking, heartbreaking, uplifting, and memorable scenes from comics from last year. These were the moments that we had been waiting all year on, the moments that took us completely by surprise, or sometimes both at the same time. And normally with our top 10s, we set up some guidelines, some rules for what counts and what doesn't, but honestly, I got nothing on this one. However, this is probably the most subjective list we're going to put together this year because no event is going to impact everyone the same way. So the only rule today is that these are just our opinions. Feel free to leave your own in the comments down below. Number 10, Spider-Man reveals his identity to J. Jonah Jameson from Peter Parker's The Spectacular Spider-Man number six. Peter Parker lived a life full of struggle and pain and in that life, J. Jonah Jameson remained one of the biggest thorns in his side. For decades, J. Jonah Jameson used his media empire to wage a one-man war on Spider-Man, turning the public against him and trying to crush his good name, all the while not even realizing that Spider-Man was standing right next to him the entire time. One of his closest employees, a man he had thought of as his protege, at times even like a son, but one night when Pete needed info that only Jonah had, he agreed to sit down for a one-time only interview, which went about exactly as you'd expect. But eventually, Pete fought back, calling Jonah pathetic, saying he's a sad old man who wasted his life on this stupid feud, and Jonah was forced to agree. He was forced to finally look at his own life. He finally had to confront what he had become. He had to finally realize that he had ruined his own career, his marriage, his entire life because he had dedicated it to taking down a man he didn't even know. But when Pete saw Jonah this week, this helpless, he did the only thing he could think of. He took off his mask and told him that someone out there still cared about him. This changed everything about their relationship in one panel. In this moment, Jonah realized that everything he knew was a lie and he had no idea what to do about it. But in the next few issues, we actually saw Jonah helping Spider-Man while still calling him an idiot, but now he actually kind of had a point. He was actually making legitimate critiques of how Pete was doing his job. We have no idea what this means for the future of Spider-Man. For all we know, they could erase Jonah's memory in the next few issues and all this will lead to nothing. But if they decide to let this stay, then it could become one of the biggest moments for Spider-Man's entire career. Number nine, Bruce Wayne meets Thomas Wayne from Batman number 22. During the button crossover event, Batman found himself thrown into the Flashpoint universe where he had died in Crime Alley instead of his parents, leading to Thomas Wayne going mad with grief and donning the mantle of Batman. Now, with a once in a lifetime encounter like this, you would of course expect it to be emotional, and there are indeed several great moments in here, such as when Batman is shocked to learn that his father is using a gun, but the biggest heart-tugging moment of the story had to be when the Flash had to return Batman home when all of this reality started to fade away, and Thomas says he has to stay and fight. And the last words to his son is to stop being Batman. For his entire life, Batman had been fighting to avenge his parents, and here his father was, a father who knew what it was like to be Batman, telling his son to stop, to find happiness, to not let this become what he was for the rest of his life. It was a moment that showed a father's love for his son, and at the same time, made Batman question his entire life. Speaking of touching father-son moments, number eight, the end of God Country. I left the title of this one a little vague, just in case anyone out there hasn't read this book, because indie books aren't like DC or Marvel. You can go years without reading them and still get the same level of enjoyment out of it no matter when you decide to finally pick it up. And the reason for that is because indie books don't have tons of people on YouTube talking about how they end, giving you every single story beat, and you don't need to know how they end in order to understand everything else happening in that universe for the next several years. So, if you haven't read this series yet, then just skip ahead to this time to get to the next number. But for anybody who's stuck around and hasn't read this yet, 
God Country is the story of Emmett Quinlan, who is living with Alzheimer's, and he is in the late stages. He doesn't remember his family, his dead wife, his son. He's become violent and incomprehensive until one day a magic sword falls from the sky, and as long as he's holding it, his mind is whole. He remembers everything. But when a god sends his servants to go and get the sword back, putting Emmett and his whole family in danger, Emmett knows there's only one thing to do. He refuses to let go of the sword because that would be like losing his loved ones all over again. Because a man deserves his memories. So he challenges the god one on one, and after the battle, as he lay dying, he uses the magic of the sword to give all his memories. The thing he prized the most, the thing he fought a god over, to his son. Emmett could never talk to his son. Even with his mind restored, he could never tell his son how he felt. So with his final gesture, he gave his son everything he had been holding back all these years. Number 7, Mr. Miracle's Attempted Suicide from Mr. Miracle Number 1. When I heard that Tom King was going to write a Mr. Miracle series, I was a bit surprised. I mean, I love Tom King, but I couldn't comprehend what he would do with Mr. Miracle. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, I'm saying that this is a guy who took the vision and made it a story about murder, prejudice, and dirty secrets in a small suburban community. He's known for taking different approaches with these characters, so when I opened up the first issue, I could instantly tell something was off. Just from the first page, it felt bleak, lonely, depressing. Then when you turn the page and you see him sitting in a bathroom with his wrist slit, yeah, that instantly let me know what I was in for. From there, the series actually goes on a very realistic tour of living with depression and PTSD, letting you know that this reveal isn't just there for shock value, it was actually there as part of telling a deep moving story, but that doesn't mean it still wasn't shocking. Number 6, Deadpool's Present from Uncanny Avengers number 21. For years, the Uncanny Avengers biggest foe was the Red Skull, who had stolen the brain of Charles Xavier, thereby making him the most powerful telepath on the planet. And he had spent all this time just waiting for the moment to strike, and this year, when that moment finally came, he kinda wrecked the whole team. He took control of their heaviest hitters, including Rogue, one of the strongest mutants on the planet, and had them tear into the other members that he couldn't control. And when the Avengers had to make one final push to stop him, Deadpool made one quick pit stop first at the remains of the old X-Men mansion, and after some digging, he found their secret weapon. And as Rogue is pummeling him with everything she had, turning him into pace so quickly even his healing factor couldn't keep up, he uses every ounce of willpower and strength that he could muster to reach into his bag, pull out his present, and... Thunk. That's it. Suddenly, the Red Skull can't feel Rogue's thoughts anymore. She stands up, turns around, and now wearing Magneto's old mind-blocking helmet, stares Red Skull down with a look that says, My turn. It's always great to see the villain of a series get the table turned on them, especially after they spent so much time winning, and this is one of the best examples of that in recent memory. But not the best one this year, and we'll talk about that later. Number 5, The Phoenix's Real Goal in Jean Grey number 10. I've said that this year, the Jean Grey series is one of the best examples of a character growing and developing because at the beginning of this book, Jean sees that the Phoenix is coming back to Earth, and it's coming for her. Now, this is the time-displaced Jean Grey, the Jean Grey trapped from the past, so it's a Jean who never got possessed by the Phoenix, never had her mind and spirit completely corrupted by this all-powerful entity. So, she spent the entire series going from one hero to another trying to learn how to approach this. She talked to other people who had been possessed and found that, yeah, there really is no good option here. It never truly left them. They were still a wreck with their mind ablaze. So she realized if she couldn't let the Phoenix possess her, she had to do the impossible. She had to fight it. She had to stop the unstoppable. So this whole year, she went from one hero to another, learning their secrets, learning how to master her powers, becoming stronger and more skilled, gathering allies, forming a plan, and when the Phoenix finally arrived, she used everything she had learned to strike back. 
and even though she knew it was impossible, she was going to do everything that she could to keep herself from becoming its new host. And with one final blast, giving it everything she had, she actually managed to hurt the phoenix. Something almost no one else had ever done. But the phoenix is truly unstoppable. And as she struggled to her feet, depleted with nothing left to give, she prepared herself to be possessed, only for the phoenix to reveal that she knew she wasn't ready for it. She wasn't strong enough to contain her. But that's not why it was here. The phoenix only cared about the original Jean Grey. The adult Jean Grey, who was strong enough for it. Everyone else was a cheap imitation, and it didn't care much for that. The Phoenix didn't come all this way crossing galaxies to possess Jean, it came all this way to kill Jean. And in one panel, it reduced Jean to ash, killing her in one shot. Now, as I said, this whole series was a great way to show a character's growth and development because she had a goal, she had a starting point, she had an end point. And every single issue it set up, here's something you can use against the Phoenix. Here's a way to fight. Here's a lesson to learn. And when the time came, she used every skill she had acquired. And with all that, she was able to do more than anyone else could. But the Phoenix still looked at her and said, you think you can stop me? Guess what? Nothing can stop me. This wasn't just a shock. This was a sucker punch. This was a series that had been telling you for a year, here's how Gene will beat the Phoenix, only to pull that football away at the last second and send us flying. Number four, Doctor Strange's secret ally from Doctor Strange number 382. After losing the title of Sorcerer Supreme to Loki of all people, Doctor Strange has learned that Loki is trying to acquire a spell that would give him control of all magic on the planet. But Doctor Strange doesn't care. He knows that there's no way he'll ever figure out how to get it. Until Loki actually starts to figure out how to get it. Strange realizes that if Loki gets this, it's game over. For everyone. But without his Sorcerer Supreme arsenal, no way is he a match for Loki. So after having everything taken away from him, including his house, his weapons, his clothes, and his closest friends, now he sees Loki about to gain ultimate power. So Strange decides it's time to do the one thing he promised he would never do. He's going to crack open the ultimate in case of emergency break glass case. And he climbs up to the top of a tall mountain and at first I thought he was returning to where he received his training in the first place. Maybe looking for something in that old temple that he could use. But instead he finds a blonde man in a sweater jacket with a white picket fence house. Okay. Not what I was expecting. And then Doc and this mystery man named Robert have a talk about returning, about how it's time. And Robert doesn't want to go back, saying he's not crazy anymore. And my mind was racing. I had no idea who this could possibly be. But after he finally agrees to help, Doc releases the spell on him, revealing that the Sentry is now ready to return. Yeah, the ultimate powerhouse in the Marvel Universe? A man so strong that the only thing that can stop him is himself? And I mean that literally because every single time that he uses his powers, a dark side of him comes to life and undoes everything good he does? Yeah, he's been in hiding all these years and he's now about to return. The writer Donny Cage tweeted the day before this book came out, please do not reveal the spoiler at the end of this issue. So I went into this issue knowing that there was going to be a twist and even prepping myself, when I turned that page, I still audibly shouted out, "Ooh!" And I'm not joking, I was on a train heading home at 1 a.m. in the morning when I read that reveal, and I still shouted out in public, "Ooh!" P.S. Sorry, Mr. Cage, for spoiling that reveal. I know you told us not to, but it's been a month, and I kind of had to for this video, so we good? Number three, Cap vs. Cap from Secret Empire number 10. I mentioned that there was one more example of the heroes turning the table on the villain who had been winning for so long, and this is it. After an evil doppelganger of Captain America took over the country, enslaved minis, imprisoned countless, destroyed cities, and trapped the heroes so they couldn't fight back, all hope seemed lost, especially after the evil Cap was able to lift Thor's hammer, 
almost making it seem like even the gods themselves had deemed his horrible agenda and malicious plans to be quote unquote worthy. But when the heroes finally were able to fight back and they were able to free the real Captain America, even though they could all gang up on this evil Cap and beat him easily, they needed to let the real Cap do it. They had to prove that he was the real one, that he was right, that this imposter didn't have the strength to stand up to the real deal. And as they fought, trading blow for blow, the doppelganger Cap decided to bust out his secret weapon. He raced for that hammer to grab it, only to reveal that he hadn't actually lifted the hammer. His reality-altering mentor had used her powers to momentarily change the inscription on the hammer, so that specifically said, if you were the strongest, which at that moment after having taken over America, he was in a position of being the strongest figure on the planet, then he would gain the powers of Hydra. So, no being worthy, no powers of Thor, it had all been a trick. So in that moment, after watching this evil Hydra Steve take over the world and send it spirally into a nightmare, the moment he tries to lift the hammer and it doesn't budge an inch, only for the real Cap to come in and lift it up, smashing this imposter in one punch, that was so rewarding. And sorry for getting political here, but it has to be brought up to talk about what made this moment so amazing in 2017. This was also a year where we saw lots of racists, bigots, and malicious, truly evil people, actual modern-day Nazis, marching in the streets saying they were the true face of America. So here, we had a member of HYDRA, you know, HYDRA, saying that they were the real Captain America, only for him to have to realize, wait, I'm, I'm not worthy? As the real Cap comes in, grabs it, and proves, no, He's the worthy one. It was impossible to not draw comparisons between that and what had been going on in the real world, and that added a whole new layer to this moment. At number two, a panther always keeps his promises from Spencer and Locke number four. Again, this is an indie book, and I know a lot of you did not read this, so skip ahead to this point if you don't want to be spoiled. And this book was damn good, so believe me, if it is at all possible for you to read this, don't let yourself be spoiled. But Spencer and Locke is basically a look at what would happen if we got the dark, gritty reboot of Calvin and Hobbes. I know, it sounds stupid, but it actually kind of works. It's the story of what if Calvin, or Locke in this world, didn't create Hobbes, or Spencer, because he was a kid with an overactive imagination, but because he needed escape from this dark world. What if he had a father who was a no-show, a babysitter who abused him, and a mother who regularly beat him to within an inch of his life? Spencer wasn't created just as a playmate, Locke created him so that someone would care about him. Someone would be there to tell him to keep on living. However, Locke went off the deep end and lost any chance of a normal life one night when his mother was going to kill him, and Locke wound up shooting her to save his own life. Cut to 20 years later, when Locke is a hard-boiled detective who is still talking to his imaginary friend and carries around a stuffed animal on all his cases. Now, for this story, he's tracking down what happened to a childhood friend of his who winds up dead only to find out that she had a daughter, and not just any daughter, his daughter. And she's been kidnapped by the mastermind behind all of this. Now this girl is scared, but Locke gives her Spencer and tells her, don't worry, he's the biggest, meanest panther in the world, and he's promised to keep you safe. However, it's just a stuffed animal. And after she gets kidnapped, there isn't much that a stuffed animal can do to help. So she's running for her life, holding on to this beat up old toy, until she finds a gun. Now she's trapped with the criminals closing in on her, and if they get her, game over. She's taken away forever, and there's no way that Spencer can save her. But if she fires the gun, then she's too far gone. Just like Spencer, it will set her down a dark road that she'll never be able to recover from. There are only two options for this girl, and neither one of them lead to a happy ending. Either she lets herself get kidnapped, or she becomes a murderer and is never able to recover from it. So the criminals are approaching. She closes her eyes, and then... Bang. Followed by silence. Only for her to then hear a voice saying, 
It's all right. You can open your eyes now. I made you a promise, and a panther always keeps his promises. She opens her eyes to see Spencer there holding the gun, protecting her from the criminal. She says that she didn't think he was real, and as he fades away, he says, I'll tell you the same thing I told your father. I'm as real as you need me to be. Now this is only my number two spot on the list, but only because of how huge the first spot is. Only because of what it did, because of how much it surprised me, and blah blah blah. You'll hear more about that in a second. But if I was just going by emotional reaction, by the size of the gasp I gave, and the level of tingle I felt up and down my skin, this would easily be number one. It had an amazing, bleak, and depressing buildup for four issues, leading to a moment that crushed all hope that you might have still been holding on to, only for the imaginary friend to come in and save the day. Yes, we all know that she still fired that gun. We know it was her who did it. We know that Spencer isn't real. But she doesn't. Sure, as she gets older, she'll realize that Spencer wasn't real. Maybe one day, a decade from now, she'll be in therapy and she'll realize what really happened, but she'll be older, and she'll be able to deal with it then. But for now, while she's still a child, the imaginary friend came in and saved her. This book gave us only two options for how her story could end, and then in the most moving twist of the year, it gave us a third option that saved her, not only from the bad guys, but from herself as well. And lastly, at number one, Batman proposes to Catwoman from Batman number 24. I'll be honest with you, this whole episode I've been trying to give you all the build up, I've been giving you the backstory, I've been trying to capture how great that moment was, but honestly, do any of you not know about this moment? I asked on Twitter what moment you guys would consider the biggest moment of the year, and hands down, no competition, this one won by a landslide. As well it should. I mean, this has probably been the longest will they, won't they in comic book history. Superman and Lois got married, Pete and MJ got married, and then some other stuff happened and we don't need to talk about that. Hell, even Archie and Betty and Veronica made a series where they got married. But these two, any time that they got together, they were apart the very next day. So to see Batman actually finally propose, which plays off the encounter he had with his father I spoke of earlier? Listen, I might have gotten more emotionally involved or more moved with other moments on this list, but this was the biggest moment. It was the moment we'll all remember. It is the moment that will change things the most. Even if they don't go through with the marriage, them just being engaged does change their lives forever. But honestly, I think this marriage might actually happen because ever since they got engaged, ever since Catwoman became a permanent addition to Batman's story, this book and this character has changed and honestly to me, it's for the better. Seeing Damien actually having to accept that his father is a man who has never allowed himself to be happy and knowing that this is the first time he's really done something for himself, that's actually really touching. Seeing Catwoman adding so much life to Batman's world that makes these stories feel new. It doesn't feel like I'm just reading a Batman story, it feels like I'm reading a new Batman story. And this is a character who for the past decade people have just been going, make it darker, darker, Batman needs to be darker and so much more serious. Yeah, seeing Catwoman actually making Batman feel upbeat and actually feel alive, yeah, it's like a whole new world for this character. So this moment brought together the biggest will they won't they couple in comics could change Batman forever, and so far, it's changed him in ways that I'm honestly loving. So even though I might not be the most passionate about this moment, I'm the most impressed by this moment. So that's why it's the number one moment of 2017. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Let me know in the comments down below or on Twitter and Tumblr at Professor Thory what your favorite moment from 2017 was. And we have one more comic book countdown to do for 2017. It is, of course, our annual Top 100 Comics of the Year, and we'll be doing that next week. So if you want to see that, or in the other top 10 videos that we're going to be doing, because we also cover games and movies on this channel, we've got some more lists coming up for them, then make sure that you click on that subscribe button. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time.